everyone. Thanks for joining us here on the Inside NASCAR, our first show of 1998. 1998 will be an exciting season as NASCAR celebrates their 50th anniversary. A lot of things going on all year long, and we'll be here on TNN on Inside NASCAR to keep you up to date on what is happening. We're back at the Jarrett House this week to continue looking back at 1997 at some of the best of. And joining me again on the show today is Stephanie boyd Derner, Tyler Potter, and Phil Wurz. Good to have you folks back. Thanks, Thanks Happy New Year. Good to be back. I would be interested in hearing what you folks' thoughts are on your most memorable moments of 1997. Well, of course, personally, I would have to say that missing the first Talladega race where it was so rainy was really a great thing because I was getting married that weekend. Uh, and uh, thank you. And after that, watching you learn to say Stephanie Boyd Derner was pretty interesting, too. But uh, from a racing standpoint, I would have to say Darlington, where Dale Earnhardt blacked out. That was a pretty scary thing to see. And then also, of course, Jeff Gordon winning the Winston Million. It was a part of history, and it was neat to be there. Well, for me, Ned, it had to be my first ever Daytona 500. It's something I'll never forget. And being down there at the end with Dale Earnhardt to see him possibly try to win his first ever Daytona 500. We all know it didn't happen. He crashed. But uh, I would say on the flip side of that, his teammate, the very last race of the year, Mike Skinner, winning in Japan when we were over there. Uh, the jubilation, elation of just seeing a rookie win his first ever race. That was terrific. I guess the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Ned, I'd have to go back to a, an event and an image. The image would be at Darlington of Jeff Gordon and Jeff Burton going into turn one, the last lap for the Winston Million for Jeff Gordon to win. Those guys beating him bang into something I'll never forget. And as an actual event, I would have to say the return to the California Speedway and the Southern California for NASCAR. After 10 long years, those fans waited a long time. They're great fans. They deserve to get NASCAR back. And I think another big moment as far as new speedways was concerned was the opening of the Texas Motor Speedway. They had some weather problems there, but nevertheless, it is one of the finest facilities in all of motorsports. We'll be back with more of the Best of 97 right after this. <laughs> Throughout 1997, we did a lot of stories on the pit crews and the teamwork in NASCAR Winston Cup racing and how important it is. And Stephanie, you saw firsthand during the running of the Winston Million what teamwork can really do. The guys did an awesome job getting us out front. Uh, I really think that they're, they were the key to what uh, won this race for us today. It means so much to do it as a team. You know, this is something they can all look back on and everybody that worked on that car and worked in the pits today can say they contributed, you know, and, and I think that's more special than anything. Both Jeff Gordon and Ray Everham will be the first to tell you they'd be $1 million poorer if it weren't for their beloved Rainbow Warriors. The crew took a second or third place car and turned it into a million dollar winner through constant refining and lightning fast pit work. In the process, they also made history by becoming the first team to ever win three straight Southern 500s. But above all, they regained the Winston Cup points lead. It was the kind of day they'd been training for for years. The kind of day that will live on for many more. You guys were a part of history on Sunday. Has that set in yet? It has uh, a little bit. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, we're very fortunate to have accomplished with this race team. And it's like, it's almost like a consistent ongoing dream you know the things we've been able to do i mean i've been i've been involved in racing for a while and uh it's just amazing that y you see that next goal and you think well you know it's like let's shoot for it you know and it's it takes a little it's going to take a little while to totally sink in but it, it's it's something special that was the icing on the cake i think the cake is that we won another race took the lead in the points championship won darlington for the third time and then on top of all that really important stuff, Winston paid the team and Jeff a, a million dollars. But it's not as if it was easy. Handling was a problem on the 24 car all day, and it was up to the crew to not only make it better, but to get Gordon out front in 17 seconds or less. You guys are awesome, man. That extra work you've been doing, you're awesome. You don't want to let him down. You want to provide him with the best the best cars, the best pit stops, the best everything, because you know that the ability he has is, is to win every race. You know, we just got to do our part to not let him down or, or have problems or, or make mistakes. When you try to do what we do in 17 or 18 seconds, that has to be a very choreographed procedure. It's got to be step by step. Everyone's got to know what they're doing throughout the entire procedure, or someone's going to make a mistake, and mistakes in the pit cost us time. 
So we, we choreograph to eliminate mistakes, and then we follow that plan on pit road. Hopefully it, it goes the way we want it to, and we've got a good pit stop. To ensure those good stops, like many other Winston Cup teams, the Rainbow Warriors practice at their shop during the week. But unlike other teams, they have their own pit crew coach in Andy Papathanasiu, and they have longevity. I think it's we've all been together so long, and we just kind of gel together, and everybody just refuses to lose, and that's our attitude. And we practice hard, we uh, put in after extra effort, and you know Ray just keeps us motivated, and we all like to win. The key, these guys say, is to concentrate on doing your job and to never forget the team's number one pledge. Does it help to have your motto, you guys wear your shirts all the time, refuse to lose? I mean, is that an inspiration to you, a constant reminder of what you gotta do? It is, it is. The, the, the words refuse to lose, and Ray said this many times, it doesn't mean that you can never lose, but it means that no matter what, you're always looking to the future. So, we win, great, that's refuse to lose. We give a good effort, but we don't win, that's refuse to lose. We have a terrible day, and we vow that next week it's going to be better. That's also refuse to lose. Can I show everybody my tattoo oh, before yeah, we go? Yeah. This is what the Rainbow Warriors is all about, the tomahawk. And uh, this is for Ray. He said he's going to get one at the uh, end of the year if we win the championship. So make sure you let everybody know that so he can't back out, OK? Whether or not the team does win another title, and whether or not Evernham gets a tattoo, there's no doubt these guys are creating one of those magical moments in racing that only come along so often. And when the history books write about Jeff Gordon's million dollar victory, you can only assume there'll be a chapter on the guys who made it happen. Now, Stephanie, did Ray Evernham ever get that tattoo? <laughs> well, Ned, not as far as we know yet, but you can bet I'm going to stay on him. And we will, too. <laughs> yeah, so stay on top of that. Now, we know that he's a master at communicating, not only with his crew, but with the driver as well. And, Phil, you did a story back earlier in the year that points out just how important that communication is between the driver and the crew chief. It really is, Ned. It can make or break a team, and it's just like a marriage. You've got to have good communication between both parties for it to be successful. And the ones that can communicate the best are the ones that win the races or at least finish in the top ten. As we found out in the piece we aired earlier in 97, if you don't have that communication, you're not going to end up in victory lane. You see it happening in the garage area every race weekend. Driver and crew chief engrossed in deep conversation. Before a car can make it to victory lane, the communication link between driver and crew chief has to be fine-tuned like a 700-horsepower engine. I think it's everything, really. I mean, if the car's not handling right, it's up to me to tell them what I think it's doing so we can make some air pressure adjustments or, or weight distribution adjustments or anything like that. So it's key. If I just sit there and drive the car and don't say nothing, it's, nothing's going to happen. You got to go out there and feel the car out, and then you got to be able to tell them the right things and communicate well enough when the change is made that you go back out and it helps the car, you know, and if, if, you, can't, if you can't tell him what the car's doing, then it's a lot harder for him to accomplish that, and uh, that's where you gain on it throughout the weekend, usually. I think it takes a special bond between the driver and crew chief. You know, they both got to be basically on the same page and, you know, have, the, have basically the same thoughts in mind and, and be able to communicate well together. And, you know, so far this year, uh, Joe Nemechek and myself will really have hit it off on a good positive note and really get along well, and, and it really helps the, the learning curve. That special bond between driver and crew chief takes time. Mutual experiences provide the comfort zone for communication between what the driver needs and what the crew chief can provide. For example, the communication bond between Jeff Gordon and Ray Evernham is perhaps the strongest in the sport, the ultimate coach, and the ultimate player. I like to look at my role as a coach. Um, I, I talk to a, a lot of different professional sports coaches. You know, he's obviously one of the greatest drivers to come along in a long time, but, but Dan Marino is a great football player, and, and, and Chipper Jones is a great baseball player, yet, you know, Don Shula and Bobby Cox still coach those guys. So. I think there are times when he needs me to calm him down or he just needs to know that somebody's there. You know, when you're out there saving your life at close to 200 miles an hour, sometimes, you know, you need somebody to back off that ad adrenaline a little bit or, or give you something to think about. And, and hopefully that's what I do for him. And for teams where the driver and crew chief are working together for the first time, how well a driver can explain what the car is doing or not doing may determine how well the team performs on race day. 
that's a challenge for Dave Charpentier and Rick Mast, who've only been working together for a couple of races. Me and Rick have talked. I try to figure out what, what kind of communication he wants during the race, uh, whether he likes his lap times every lap or and the leader's lap times and just the kind of information he needs. And I've also talked to him about what I need during the race to make adjustments to the car. And uh, Rick's really easy going, easy to talk to, and I think it'll work pretty well. You got to make that driver comfortable, you know. Uh, it ain't any different than uh, the normal everyday guy driving down the highway. You can drive a new car, probably and steer it with one finger down the highway at 80 mile an hour, and you can take an old junker and you're hanging on white knuckle for dear life trying to drive it down the highway at 80 mile an hour. So it, that's the difference you're looking for, that comfort zone at that speed. And uh, you just got to trust what the driver's telling you. You know, his seat of the pants feel, there's something there. If he tells you that, even though it doesn't show up on a piece of paper, you got to go by that and try to uh, find a way to fix that area, and then usually the speed comes anytime you fix it. Some drivers take more of an active role mechanically with the race car. Rusty Wallace is a prime example of a driver who helps make his crew chief, Robin Pemberton's job, a little easier. I think it helps a lot. It's just how I was brought up. It's the only way I know how to do it. And I know there's some drivers out there that just don't know anything at all about a car. Uh, literally nothing. Just drive it, and that's it. And I guess that's one way to approach it. But I've always had to understand the, the operations of the car, the shocks, the springs, and understand how they're built and what it takes to do it to, to make myself work right. I tell you, that's one of Bobby Hamilton's strongest assets. People in this garage don't realize how much knowledge he has about the chassis, and he can relate it back to his seat when he's driving. But uh, Bobby's really a chassis driver. You know, Rusty Wallace, a lot of people talk about him. But uh, most of these race tracks, I put Bobby right up there with him. He's probably one of the more knowledgeable drivers about a race car on the Winston Cup circuit, and, and it makes my job a whole lot easier when he can come in and, you know, instead of just, uh, you know, instead of just telling me the problem with the car, a lot of times he's got some good input as to what he feels from the seat of the race car to, to be able to help you fix that, and it's, it's a tremendous advantage. Ned, you know, some of these teams really have this communication thing down. For instance, John Andretti, who will rejoin the SDP team and Robbie Lewis for 98. John says Robbie can look into his eyes and know if the car is the way he wants it or if he needs a change. So nonverbal communication, also very important in NASCAR. Well, that's what they really look for. How do you become a crew member? We'll have a story on that when we come back. Welcome back to Inside NASCAR as we continue to look at the best of 1997. As we travel around the country, we're asked the question a lot. How do you become a crew member in NASCAR? But Tyler, you did a story on that, and it's not easy. No, it's not, Ned. It really, uh, a lot of people think it's just a weekend-only job, and that's the case with the part-timers. But the guys that are running full-time, they really have to go year-round in this thing, and it also helps being in the right place. You know, for a lot of these Winston Cup teams, making it as a crew member is the culmination of many years of hard work. Do you think you have what it takes to get to this level? We talked to some prominent crew chiefs about their careers and what they look for in a crew member. If you, if you follow the lines that I did, you just picked up all your stuff and, uh, you know, I had $90 in my pocket and uh, a few hand tools and I moved from upstate New York to North Carolina back in 79. And uh, a lot of times that's just what it takes. You have to show desire in order to get in. So you're looking for experienced people, of course, but there's just not that many of them around. You know, I, I look for people that really have the desire and the intelligence to do it. You know, you can take someone who's intelligent and has desire and they can learn to do anything that there is. This business is a lot about commitment and there's so many people from the outside that I don't think they really realize the kind of commitment that it takes to do this. The, the people that do this week to weekend that are good at it have made a lot of sacrifices in their, in their life. It takes a special kind of a, a special kind of a person. Nobody knows that better than Jasper's Mike Harold. For a year and a half, he paid his own way to all the races, often sleeping on hotel room floors just to get the opportunity to work on a Winston Cup crew. It all paid off January 1st when Mike was hired full-time as shop organizer. It's definitely a relief, you know, getting hired full-time this year, and the hotels are a lot nicer. I don't have to drive as much. <laughs> 
So it's definitely eased up, but um, it, it, it's all worth it. it. The work's gotten harder and the hours are longer, but um, it's definitely worth it. It's a little easier for a more established team to take somebody on like that because of they already have their experienced people in place. So as a first-year team, we really need more experienced people because that we are a first-year Winston Cup team. The positions on a Winston Cup crew include two tire changers, two tire carriers, jack man, gas man, catch can man, window washer, grill cleaner, pit board, gas runners, mileage loggers, tire measurers who also air the tires as well as maintain tire selection for the race, and crew chief. They're all important. Uh, you know, even a guy handing the drink of water in, if he dumps it on the driver's lap and the driver's not paying attention when the jack drops, you know, it costs you a position on the racetrack. The number of people on a crew can vary. For example, the 77 team is comprised of 15 people. Penske has around 18, while the Hendrick Bone 24 team uses a crew between 22 and 25 to compete on a race weekend. It's just a matter of what level you want to compete on. And uh, we've got people that do things probably that other teams don't do. Uh, we have people that just watch other teams for me and uh, tape things and keep uh, records and notes and we, we bring back up pit crew members and things like that if, if a tire changer you're in a championship battle and a tire changer would have hurt his ankle on pit road what do you do so we actually have some backup people a crew chief is both a mechanic and manager dealing with team members in sometimes adverse conditions well you know it gets that way you know after about when you're in one of them 16 17 week stretch you know, everybody starts getting just a little bit on each other's toes, and that's where, you know, you just got to call each one of them off the side and say, look, you know, we're working together. Let's just, you know, calm down a little bit and just go after our job and make sure everything's done. But the job has its upside, too. You know, there's guys here, that, you know, some guys have won a lot of races and some guys are fairly new, and, and we actually had a couple guys win at Daytona with us for the first time, and, and that's, uh, you know, it's always new and refreshing when you see people that have made a lot of sacrifice get rewarded for it completely happy there are days that you would uh, you definitely would trade it in for a, a, a suntan oil place on the beach but uh, you know where else would you be you know the uh, you, know, you work with a lot of nice people and uh, you, you know sometimes you get to travel and sometimes you have to travel and you know I at this point in my life it's a little late to trade it in and uh, I don't, I'm not so sure I would anyway Ned, you heard Robin at the end of that piece pretty much sum it all up. You know, he could trade it all in to go to the beach, but he says he just loves what he does, and I guess that really exemplifies what all these guys are all about. Well, they must love it because, really, there's a lot of risk involved in this job. There is risk involved out there. When 40 cars come down pit road all at the same time, six or seven guys go over the wall, there's risk all over the place, as you found out in a story you did last year. Yeah, we sure did, Ned. We found out, too, it's got to be dangerous when you got a crew guy out there named Rambo. You hope for 17, 18 seconds you can climb over that wall, be focused and do the job you have to do. But you talk to any of those crew guys, any of the over-the-wall gang, and they'll tell you, any time on pit road is a dangerous time. It only takes about 18 seconds. You hope it only happens four or five times per race. It's necessary, it's precision, and it's potentially dangerous. If you start thinking about it, then that's going to slow you down. I've felt cars that, you know, they feel like they just about run over the back of your feet and stuff. Just one pit stop can make or break a team during a race, and for those fast, frantic, frenzied moments, when 30 or more cars come down pit road at the same time, each team can only worry about a small rectangular box where their driver is waiting for service. Yeah, you're basically concerned about yourself, and, and you look at the other people, and you make sure that nothing's going wrong. And if something does happen, you know, you hope somebody can react to it. But every time I go across the wall, I say to myself, as soon as I step off the wall, I say, be aggressive. If you have the experience and you know what to look out for, I don't think it's that uh, much of a danger as it could be. But sometimes experience can help the unexpected and the unavoidable. Oh, man. Look out, it's Jackman. Do you think about the incident at Daytona when you when you, does it ever flash through your mind when you're going through there? No, it never did until the last Daytona re race and we got in another wreck and I thought about it when he was coming down through there then but he checked his brakes and we knew everything was going to be all right. Atlanta 1990, site of one of the most tragic pit road incidents ever. 
Bill Elliott's crewman, Mike Rich, is killed when Ricky Rudd's car slams into the Coors pit. Slams into the right rear of the Bill Elliott. Because of that incident and others, NASCAR began implementing rules to make pit roads safer starting in 1991. One of the most effective ones has been decreasing the speeds along pit road. For instance, at Bristol and Martinsville, the short tracks, pit road speeds 25 miles an hour. In places like Daytona, Talladega, and here at Pocono, pit road speed is 65 miles an hour. Pit road speed now, pit road speed. I think it has helped, uh, you know, it's made the drivers a lot more aware, it's made the, the crew members a lot more aware of what can happen. Uh, still, you get to some of the tracks where the pit stalls are so congested. Pit road speed now, pit road speed. It's great, you know, I mean, there, there hasn't been an accident. A couple guys have been hit, you know, but um, I think a lot of the racetracks need to go back and rework their pit roads. Daytona is probably one of the worst pit roads we have, and it's just too tight. Pocono, it's because it's such a long straightaway, it's got the biggest pit road, so there's really not a whole lot of danger here at Pocono. Pit road speed now, pit road speed. Oh, it's helped out tremendously. It's made it a lot safer because, you know, seven, eight years ago when they had no speed, it, it was really hectic in there. A lot of things happen in a, in a very short amount of time, and they happen, uh, it's, it's funny, it's almost like a chaotic ballet. And when you're doing that, and when you go over that wall, those guys concentrate on one thing, and that's that race car, that, and that job on that race car that they have to do. And that creates a situation of uh, blocking out everything else around them. Well, but there's a whole lot of other things going on around him, and that, that, that creates a very hectic situation. Mark Armstrong is the rear tire changer for Dale Earnhardt. While on the right side, he can't worry about what the car behind Thurfit is doing. The key is to focus on the job and try to put the potential danger out of your mind. It's really time to, you know, put all that out of your mind. You got the job to do, and you just got to focus and pay attention to it because this business is so competitive now. It's, you just can't make any mistakes, you know, and um, you just try to really focus and pay attention and, to what's going on with just you and not what's going on, and, you know, around you. Uh, I try to make myself aware of things and be able to handle whatever situation might come happen. Remember that first year. Okay, get on out of here now. Get away, coming, get away, coming. Clear road, clear road, clear road. Being aware and communicating with fellow crew members helps decrease the danger along pit road too. Every week, 43 teams are out looking for the fastest and most efficient pit stops possible. And despite the potential dangers, the rewards for all the crew guys in the pits is worth it. We got a job to do in 18 seconds, and if we can't get that job done, then the, the fans get upset and, and whatever. And we're here to please the fans and please our sponsor, uh, Ford Quality Care, and, and make our driver get to victory lane every week. And that's what they do, shoot for, is to get in victory lane, makes all that danger worthwhile. Well, we've shown you what good pit stops look like. When we come back, we're going to show you what a bad stop looks like. <laughs> so you stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Inside NASCAR as we continue our best of 97. Each year, there is competition for the NASCAR Winston Cup team's pit crew competition at the North Carolina Motor Speedway at Rockingham. And there's also, prior to that, pit crew competition for members of the media. So we decided we needed to enter a team for Inside NASCAR. And Ned, maybe that was our first mistake. But I know our second mistake was when Tyler said he wanted to be one of the tire changers. And we let him. I'm going to set the record straight though right now, Seth. Our team was cursed from the get-go. The last Inside NASCAR team, the guy in the front tire, also had problems changing that front tire. So I can't completely be blamed well, hey, for this. Hey, I had a great perspective, Ned, because not only was I the rear tire changer working beside Tyler and jumping over the wall, but actually got done back <laughs> over the wall and saw him finish By 11, 11 seconds. seconds. Right. <laughs> 11 seconds. Okay, hold on. Let's roll the tape. The third annual Media Pit Crew Challenge was held this past Tuesday at the North Carolina Motor Speedway in Rockingham, North Carolina. We were in it. Our inside NASCAR team was comprised of myself, Phil and Stephanie, Kim Novak, and photographers Matt Thomas and Ted Lukaitis. We were one of four teams competing for the championship. Our crew chief was Walter Smith, the jackman for Terry Labonte's number five team. Now, we all know Terry's the defending Winston Cup champ, but his team is the defending Unical Pit Crew champion. So who better to learn from than the best? What this is, is this is a um, pre-pit stop talk to the winning team in this year's competition. Okay, I have meaning, meaning both, meaning both. We, def we intend on defending our crown and we intend on having the inside NASCAR folks 
taking the crown this year in this year's competition. So I can see it in your eyes, the determination, you're ready to go. We picked our roles on the team. Phil and I were the tire changers. Matt and Ted were the tire carriers. Stephanie took care of the gas while Kim handled the catch can. But we weren't just going to be thrown into the fire. After all, none of us had ever done this before. So Walter briefed us on the fundamentals. You just push it in there, okay, until you see this collapse. Yeah, push right. in. No. There you go. Okay? okay? And then that's how the, the gas is dispensed into the race car. In like that, holding it right there. Okay? Any overflow that would come out would come out into the catch can. Okay. Okay? Remember, this is lugs off. Okay? Hitting the hub. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? Whichever rhythm you want to go, counterclockwise, whichever you feel comfortable with. Okay, now you just lay the tire right around this hub here. Say it. All right, now you put it on just like that. Switch the gun. Okay, hit your five lugs. All right, set your gun, switch it, switch it. All right, now pull. Uh -uh, no, no, no. There you go. All right, wait now. All right, let's try this again, okay? That's okay. That's okay. Both knees down. Both knees down? Yep, get a good stable. All right, all right it's not going to come off. You need to stay on them long. Okay. Full throw all the way on, center on the hub. Now off. See how they spin off right, like that? Right. Okay, change your gun. Okay. Grab the tire. That right here. Right there. Right there and there. Yep. Pull it towards you. Don't stand up. Stand though. up. Okay. Stay on your knees. Tyler, please stay on your knees. Tyler, please stay on your knees. <laughs> All right. So I had the team behind me, but what about Terry? I'm on the tire changer crew. I'm doing the front side, so uh, I was a little bit slow. Well, that's uh, that's the toughest part. You can't be slow changing the front tire because. You know, when the car comes in, he's got to be around there in front of it, and then he's got to be out of the way when the car leaves. Now, before going, we got to see Terry's crew in action in a simulated two-tire pit stop. It was picture-perfect until Terry hit a stray tire upon leaving his stall. Hey, even they were human. The first team posted a time of 34 seconds. The second team was much quicker at 24 seconds. The third team was quickest at 23 seconds. Finally, it was our turn. Team Inside NASCAR sprung into action. Well, kind of. There were problems right from the start. It's a wonder our time wasn't dead last. The abuse soon followed. Tyler, man, you got beat by the girl. <laughs> no, I got beat by Phil. You're this close to victory. So close, but yet so far. It's okay, Tyler. You call it triple A if you have a flat tire. <laughs> Tyler, this is yours because nut on, nut <laughs> off, nut on, nut off. Here you go. You take that one. I'll take this. Here, give me the bad one. That'll have more memories for you. Oh, is that bad, huh? <laughs> That's pretty bad. <laughs> Is there any way possibly you'd let me drive for the car if I couldn't change the tire? No, but we'll find something for you to do. Well, guys, I guess there's not too much lost. It was all for fun anyway. Right? It may be fun, Ned, but I'm telling you, I took an awful lot of bashing ever since that point. And it's not over yet. We do have a belated Christmas present for Tyler. We have your own air gun. Remember, tire on, tire off. I still can't use it because the hose isn't here, though. <laughs> hey, it wouldn't help, would it? Next okay. year, catch can. Okay, <laughs> break us up. We need to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have the mailbox. There's lots more to come on this edition of Inside NASCAR. The Inside NASCAR Mailbox is brought to you by Miller Lite. Our question today is from Barbara Baxley from Georgetown, South Carolina. 
what type and how thick is the glass in the windshield of a race car? Hi, I'm Mike Hillman, crew chief of the number 46, First Union Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Barbara, thanks for writing in and with your question about uh, windshields. We actually run Lexion windshields in these race cars today, which are shatterproof, which is safer for the drivers and a little bit easier to keep clean. If you have a question for the Inside NASCAR mailbox, write to us at Inside NASCAR, Post Office Box 240417, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28224. If we use your question on the air, you'll receive this embroidered Miller Lite jacket and a cap and shirt from Chase Authentics, the authentic trackside apparel of NASCAR. Well, it's time for us to take a short break right now. When we come back, we'll see how a team prepares a race car for race day, so you stay with us. Welcome back to Inside NASCAR. We've looked at how to become a pit crew member, how to make good pit stops, how to make bad pit stops. Now let's take a look at how to prepare a car for a race. And Phil, you did a story on that last year. That's right. We were at Pocono Ned, and we followed the Wood Brothers team of Michael Waltrip, the number 21 Sitco Ford. And it's really amazing what goes on from the time the gates and the garage opens at 7 a.m. until race time five or six hours later. We had a chance to follow the Wood Brothers for an entire morning, and here's what happened at Pocono. The day starts the same as every other Winston Cup team, waiting until 7 a.m. when the garage gates officially open and the teams all begin pre-race preparation. The Wood Brothers have been a part of this sport for almost half a century, so race day setup is nothing new, but every week provides different challenges. Eddie and Lynn Wood are the primary decision makers come race day, and for the hours leading up to the race, the checklist is the Bible on Sunday. The checklist is a detailed step-by-step -step outline of what needs to be done to make the sit-go forward go. To make Michael comfortable 500 miles. We have about 20 people up, you know, every weekend, and um, everybody has got something to do. You know, and they go do their thing, and you know, one one guy's responsible for this or that, and and he he is he is the man for that, and and he'll go check it, and you don't worry about it. We got a checklist, and we go over that. When you get ready to to go on the line, you just look at it, and make sure everybody's checked whatever's supposed to be checked, and then you get into the deal. Like this morning, we're making one spring change and a spoiler change. So after everything is checked over and done, a car is back on the ground, ready to roll out. Then you make your changes, and then it's ready to race. While the car gets prepped in the garage, the pit cart goes out to pit road before 8 a.m. The pit cart is supplied with equipment necessary for the Wood Brothers to keep Michael Waltrip's day at Pocono a smooth one. Got a compartment over here, we can store the air, air gun. I'll get those out in just a minute and boil them and uh, breathe them. We've got a TV where we watch the race as it's going on. We've got a monitor from NASCAR that gives a rundown on the positions of the cars, each lap, and uh, your other pit support stuff, the hoses. One of the items the crew set up on Sunday morning on the pit cart is something that looks like a big fishing pole. What it actually is, is a pit camera and allows the teams to see if they're making time or losing time in the pits. It's also a good way to say hi to everybody in the morning. Hi, everybody. How many tires did you guys bring out here? Uh, we'll probably have nine pits in the pits today. What are, you, what are you writing down? What numbers? What do they mean? Um, these codes, what we do, get the codes off the beach. Uh, each tire and try to match them up, so we'll try to have a match up set. Sometimes it means a lot, and sometimes it don't. But we try to get the codes off the back of the tire, off the front of the tire, and match them up with a serial number. Of course, at 10 a.m. Sunday morning, the DSS dish comes in real handy because we can all watch inside NASCAR on TNN. To get to the point where it's almost automatic, it becomes routine. Wood Brothers have been racing so long that does it just become habit forming after a while? Well, it is. I mean, we do the same thing every Sunday morning. I mean, the same guys work on the same parts of the car, and we, you know, I wind up, Michael and I will discuss what we want to start the race, you know, tire pressure or wedge or this or that, and every morning it's about the same thing. It's just a different place. At 10.50, the team makes final pre-inspection adjustments to the Sitco Ford. Then about a half hour later, the checklist is complete and Eddie Wood disposes of it properly. 
A minute later, Michael Waltrip's car is ready for inspection and it's wheeled out of the garage for NASCAR's white glove test. NASCAR goes over every car the exact same way, making measurements, checking every inch of every car so no one team will have an advantage over another. But we did ask someone to help provide just perhaps a slight advantage from above. Father, we've uh, been shadowing the Michael Waltrip team all morning long to see what they do before the race. Would you mind blessing the car for them? <laughs> That's a, a good blessing on it, okay? Okay. Good luck in the race. Okay, thank you very kindly. Thank you. At 11.48, the Wood Brothers Sitco Ford entry is ready to go racing. Now you have to live with the decisions you made for the last five hours. There's a lot of stuff that goes on on Sunday morning. Those guys work their tail off right up till 12, 12.30. And, uh, you know, right now we're less than an hour away from the race, and they're still rolling them through inspection. And those guys got to get them a bite to eat and get out there on pit road and be ready to pit the race car when the race starts. So, uh... My hat's off to the whole, whole crowd on the sit-go team because they just work so hard. By 1 o'clock, Michael Waltrip has his game face on. A final word of encouragement from wife Buffy and some final instructions from Eddie Wood. And the sit-go Ford Thunderbird is ready to race. Six hours of pre-race prepping is done. And uh, we'd like to thank the Wood Brothers again for letting us do that story. And while blessing's always nice, it was only good enough for a 17th place finish for Michael that day. But looked like the man upstairs was in number 88's corner, Dale Jarrett. He might be pretty good. He won that race that day. And I guess uh, I can be happy with that. We need to take a short break right now. And as we leave you for this break, let's take a look at what we have coming up next week right here on the Inside NASCAR. The off-season's over, and we're heading south for testing at the World Center of Speed. The Winston Cup teams prepare for Daytona, and we'll have the update. Last season, he joined Richard Childress Racing as the Man in Black's head wrench. Going into 1998, he plans to join Dale Earnhardt in Victory Lane. You'll go one-on-one -on -one with Larry McReynolds. Plus, how do you keep up with your favorite driver? We'll have the answer with a look at NASCAR fan clubs. All this and more next week on Inside NASCAR. Welcome back to Inside NASCAR. You know, road racing has been a big part of NASCAR racing for many years, even back when I drove race cars more than 30 years ago. And as NASCAR celebrates its 50th anniversary this year, we wanted to take a look at some of the road courses that were run on many years ago, including Bridgehampton, New York, and Riverside, California, some of those that they don't run on today. Last year at Watkins Glen, Jeff Bodine got a much-needed win, and earlier this year, Mark Martin led the Valvoline team to victory lane at Sears Point. Now let's turn the road course clock back a bit to 1958, when the Riverside International Raceway was awarded a Winston Cup event. One of the biggest names at Riverside in the 60s was a young man by the name of Dan Gurney. He was driving the number 121. From 1963 through 1968, Gurney won five times, including three in a row. The only driver to have more victories at Riverside was Bobby Allison with a total of six. Most race fans have heard of Riverside, Sears Point, and Watkins Glen, but what about Bridgehampton in New York? In 1964, Richard Petty, Richard's dad Lee Petty, Fred Lorenzen, and our very own Ned Jarrett with the driver's fans came out to watch. On this particular day in 1964, Richard Petty took his 10th victory of the season by 25 seconds over second place Lorenzen. Race queen Tori Finneran and a big trophy were Petty's rewards and a little kiss for a job well done. The very first winner at Watkins Glen was Buck Baker in 1957. But there was an absence of Winston Cup at Watkins Glen from 1965 until the series returned on August the 10th, 1986. On that day, it was Tim Richmond driving the Folgers Chevrolet to Victory Lane for car owner Rick Hendrick. You know, we wanted to get a lead and then, you know, be able to back off a little bit, you know, get a good substantial lead. And, and we did a few times, but, you know, everybody in the back, Neil and, and Daryl and... Uh, 
a few other ones, uh, they kept running hard, and uh, I think that's what was able to give me a, a little advantage at the end was the, uh, you know, was the fact that they used the cars up a little bit, maybe too much to stay with me. The two Winston Cup road course races each year may not determine who wins the championship, but it could give a driver a spot in the record books alongside drivers such as Dan Gurney, Mario Andretti, and Supertech's A.J. Foyt. Keep in mind that Mark Martin is the winningest driver at Watkins Glen with three victories. He was the winner three straight years, 1993, 94, and 95. So Mark Martin might be a pretty good pick for this year's Bud at the Glen. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for this show. We hope you enjoyed it, and our thanks to you folks for coming to our house and let me stay at home made it easier for me. Thanks for having us, Ned. Hey, we all look forward to 1998, don't we? Yeah, there's a lot to look forward to this year, Ned, especially with NASCAR's 50th anniversary coming up. It's going to be a huge media blitz. It's really an exciting time to be a part of the sport of NASCAR racing. If I had to pick a couple of things to look forward to this year, Ned, one would have to be the first night race at Daytona in the middle of July on that huge track. And also, too, R.J. Reynolds' No Bull 5 program, five different drivers starting at the Daytona 500 can win $5 million, and five fans can win the same. Be exciting. You know, Phil, I've really enjoyed just working with you and also with you, Stephanie, and really with you too, Ned. It's just been a great experience this whole year with Inside NASCAR, and really you meet a lot of great people in this sport, and I guess that's why a lot of people end up staying this for a lifetime. Well, thank you, Tyler. It's good to have you on our team, and there are a lot of good people in the sport of auto racing. It makes all of us want to stay around for a long, long time. And you know, to add to there, the excitement that Stephanie and Phil were talking about, you got the new Taurus for 1998, you got the new SB2 Chevrolet engine, so plenty to talk about every week, and we're going to be here on TNN talking about it, so you join us.